Hi everybody, I'm Dan Schmidt. I am joined today with Pat Maitine. Uh, now tell me, Pat, is it Maitine or Maitine? Maitine. Maitine. We've known each other for almost 30 years, and I've mispronounced his name, and he forgives me. No one um, can pronounce my last nobody name. Nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> they, they call you Mitten, Mitten. Yeah, uh, when the teacher would mumble something that started with an M, I'd just yeah. raise my hand, you know. Okay, Pat doesn't remember this. That's why I'm giving you this story right away. This would have been in about October of uh, 1996 or 7. I can't remember. All right, I'm already guessing where you're going. We were in Illinois. Mm -hmm. It was 1996. And um, I was shooting a dart and bow with my fingers, with a finger tab, full-length arrows because I didn't know you could cut them short, feathers. I brought six arrows to camp. I was on this media hunt with Woods Wise, Gary Sefton, Gary Clancy, uh, it was like a who's who of uh, outdoor riders and bow hunters. And I went out and I shot all my arrows at two deer that morning. I had no arrows left. And this guy, who I thought was just an arrogant prick, sorry, um, he's like, what, are you even aiming out there? And I'm, 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 like, I'm like all offended and everything. Well, Gary Clancy comes up to me, rest his soul, the nicest man I've ever known, the most gregarious, uh, interesting guy, storyteller. He said, don't worry, I got you covered. And uh, he gave me about, uh, uh, actually, he gave me about four arrows, and then you actually came along and gave me about two or three. And I had so many mismatched arrows in that quiver. Um, do you remember that? Remember that story? Barely. And guess what? I shot all those arrows at deer, and I didn't, and, and didn't go home with a deer that trip. Oh, wow. I don't remember that part. So then after that, uh, Gary died. Uh, he was a Vietnam vet. He, he contracted uh, some kind of disease from Agent Orange exposure. Um, and... To the, I mean, for the next 20 or more years, every time he wrote a book or I saw him somewhere, you know, if he was signing autographs, he would always sign my books, his books to me, to Dan, Deadly Dan, you can borrow my arrows anytime. <laughs> so there's a, there's a little bit of history between us. We've shared many camps. Uh, Pat was a deer and deer hunting contributor for many years, a columnist, the, the bow shop column. You remember him? Uh, I consider him in the top 1% of bow hunters and archers in America, and I don't say that because he's sitting here, I just say it because I mean it. I've seen him hunt, he's a hell of a hunter, and he's a hell of an archer. Uh, Pat, you know, welcome to Deer Talk Now. Yeah, nice to be here. I have one more anecdote with the, from that trip. Oh, you remember it now? Oh yeah, okay. no, I remember all of this, but what I remember the most is where I thought you were gonna go with this, is we were both very young and just getting our start. I had just, kind of become a made man you know that's you, you have to starve to death for 10 years in this yep. industry before you're allowed to play remember that if you're young and you're listening and to dan was saying i am considering quitting my job and freelancing what do you think and i said do you have a wife and kids and he says yes and i said don't do it man you, no. i didn't have a wife and kids at the time but uh, i was i was getting close to I, it uh, don't don't yeah. do it don't do it yep. you know so um here you are you here know. i am Yep. So you stuck, you stuck with the, the real job, and here you are. You know. I do, and, and I do remember that, and, I, and actually your words were um, instrumental in me not taking that path. <laughs> now, I don't know if it was good or bad, but uh, I stuck with deer and deer hunting all this time, so I think that's good because I absolutely well, live and breathe this brand. You know, it's hilarious because my parents, like, I want to be an outdoor writer. I want to be a guide, a hunting guide. They're like, you're crazy. You can't make a living doing that, so... Here but you I, did it. Here I am, you know, 30-some years later, you know, not just making a living, making a good living. but. And you were guiding, like, elk hunters in New Mexico, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was yeah. an outfitter in New Mexico for 23 years. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, and then freelance forever, the, you know, the entire time. Now I own a couple magazines. So, you know, it's... Um, we can mention it. He, uh, Pat is part over Inside Archery. Yeah, inside it, archery, inside firearms. Inside firearms, and we're all friends. I mean, that's not like we we're not sitting here saying, "Oh my God, he works for the competition." It's a it's a small industry. There's niches for everyone. Yeah, and we you know we're dealer magazines. We don't compete with deer and deer. Yeah, it's a trade. Here. So I mean, if anybody knows what a trade show is, that's what we're actually filming this podcast. But um, you're that is the cool thing about mm. this industry is we're all competitors, but we're all friends too. Yeah. Know? So we 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 all get along. And I have to know? mention, remember our hunt in Kansas last year. Oh, yeah. Remember when we swapped outfits? Oh, yeah. I still I, have that. I have that T-Sins, and I wore it when I, when I plowed the driveway last week. And I'm like, thank you, Pat. This is my backup. Uh, that's the warmest outfit 
that I have. Well, the one that I got from you is noisy, but that's what I do with it. Same too. thing. It's it's the one I have weighs a ton. But I if you're on the tractor plowing snow, it's awesome. I don't remember what the deal was. You said it wasn't big enough for you or something. I, that's what I'm using mine for, sitting on the tractor plowing snow. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so what we're going to talk about, though, is, um, okay, he said we are friends. We are. We follow each other, uh, you know, throughout the year. But on Facebook, you can live vicariously through any of us. And I always live vicariously through Pat because he is... Uh, not only a great bow hunter, but a, a, a mountain bow hunter, which is different. I, I kind of understand it because I grew up hunting the Northwoods, but it's different. Um, you killed a buck that you've been after for quite a while this year in Idaho. Yeah, the well, just to preface the whole thing, I mean, the thing you got to understand about hunting in Idaho, you're hunting whitetails and elk habitat. I mean, I hunt elk in the same places I hunt whitetail so mountain big mountains rough mountains no bedding areas no feeding areas no agriculture to speak of it's just woods and mountains so I don't know what the bow hunting success rate is where I live I bet you it's in the single digits Mm -hmm. and our deer I couldn't I can't say unstockable but They're hunted by mountain lions year-round. They're hunted by wolves year-round. Our rifle season is longer than bow season, although I am allowed to bow hunt during rifle season. But rifle season's two months long. Bow season's one month long. Man. If that makes any sense That makes no sense. Oh, it's crazy. One month bow season. That's it. Wow. Well, I can bow hunt during rifle season, but I have to pay an extra... $18 $18 for that privilege. Okay, that's nuts. Okay. Yeah, it's very bizarre. And, um, but, you know, it's funny when I work retail shortly, when you mention, like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be slaughtering our whitetails with rifles in the middle of the rut, people want to fist bite you. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you freaking bow hunters want everything. You know, it's like, so in the last few years, they've actually cut the rifle season back a little bit trying to give them some slack during the rut all right why not just make it bow hunting people would get used to it they would continue hunting but it, i'm getting off in the weeds but anyways the so yeah you know the the mountain hunting is very unique very challenging it's um you're hunting hunting scrapes hunting topography that's very difficult it's and you have to be very patient mm-hmm. I mean, i've sat some of the best bucks I've killed in Idaho, I've sat 27 days straight. Man. Are kill. you hunting all day? Oh, yeah. Yeah. During the rut. Now, see, early season and, and the rut is two different things. Uh, our season opens the 30th of August. You actually have an opportunity to kill a velvet buck where I live. I am absolutely snake bit on that. I, something always goes wrong. And I've shot bucks that have rubbed their velvet five minutes before I killed them. Literally, like, their horns are bloody. Um, I've had all kinds of things go wrong. The big big problem where I live, our deer are so spooky. If I can hit full draw, I have one. But that's like a 50-50 thing. Oh, dang. You do not stand up to shoot. You do not wear anything with a membrane in it. You don't... Shot timing has to be on the money. Again, mountain lions. I just, I think it was it was late August, early September. I went and checked cameras on one ranch that the only private land that I hunt, and it's like a ten thousand acre ranch and half farm and half big wild canyon. And I think I had fifteen cameras out, miles apart, you know, on this huge ranch. I had mountain lions on five different cameras oh in one week. Wow. So that's my competition, you know. And that's tough competition. Though. Oh, it, it, it is amazing to me, though. I check a camera and, like, oh, mountain lions. And then, like, 10 minutes later, oh, there's my buck. You know, they're intermingling constantly. I don't know how they... Well, they have to live together, but um, the only experience I've had with it was in Wyoming, where, where they have cats and they have deer. Those deer are as on edge... Oh. is our Northwoods deer or our central farmland deer that just where you've got 30 hunters per square mile. Well, we have that too. You oh, know. you do? Okay. Well, so we mm-hmm. have 
We have mountain lions, we have wolves, and we have intense hunting pressure. Did not know about the intense hunting pressure. It's, oh, it's, we got, you know, it's, especially during the rut, because the rifle season opens like on the 10th of October. You can hunt elk and deer for the first couple of weeks, and then deer season goes all, all the way through, depending on the unit, like into mid November or the end of November. So, no, there's intense rifle hunting pressure. Luckily, rifle hunters in Idaho do not sit in stands. So oh, okay. they just wander around. They kill plenty of deer. But you get into some thick areas and sit stands. I mean, the deer are still moving. Um, the rifle hunters tend to pound any open country. So clear cuts and farm country just get shot flat. In the big woods... I suppose there's some guys still hunting through that stuff, but it, it'd be tough. Okay, so we got off on another rabbit hole. Um, the buck that you shot is in that kind of terrain, that kind of situation. When were you first aware that this deer existed? Uh, that was actually the season before, so 2022. I was getting this buck on camera a lot, and then I hunted, hunted, you know, the area, and I passed him twice and how big was he then oh you know 130 like a four-year-old three-year-old four and a half year old okay uh 130 four by four and he was big enough to make you twitch but you're like you know he needs another year and couple times i mean i passed him and he'd walk off and i'm like oh what was what was i thinking it's like god if he comes back i'm shooting him you know he was that he's that big and then this year because i saw him through the winter um here and there and actually found his sheds and um because he i was seeing him in this field there's a there's an open field with a bunch of uh, wild roses and there are deer coming out there and eating the rose hips and so i was seeing him fairly regular um with through the binoculars then one morning he didn't have his antlers so i spent about three days with the dog you know circling circling i finally found both of it the dog found one of them and i circled and found the other one so i had his his match sheds fresh and so then this year well 2023 i got him on camera really early like first week of august twice and then he disappeared. So where I live, when you have a dry summer, the assumption is that he died of blue tongue. Which I is, didn't realize you had that up there. Oh, yeah, very common. <clears throat> Whenever we have dry, well, this was, this was near my house, more, cl- you know, down in the lower, you know, edge of the farm country. The high country deer, the blue tongue doesn't affect as much because they're drinking out of springs and flowing water. The farmland deer, it just it knocks the crap out out of them because they're drinking out of water holes when those water holes shrink down and expose all that mucky mud the the gnats that live in that mud is what uh, you know bites them around the tender parts of the eyes and ears and that's what causes it where i live and so you know when you have a deer drop off radar you think oh boy you know blue tongue got him or a lion got him so and I literally, like, I had written him off. He disappeared. And even in September when they're in the velvet and they move better, I just, I didn't get him again. And the area is pretty saturated with cameras. So then, oh, I don't know, late October, early November, I actually saw him from my living room window. Huh. Because I said, oh, look, a deer. Grabbed the binoculars and I said, oh, my God, he's alive. There he is. I mean, he's way off, but like, wow, he's alive. So I went and checked cameras, nothing. Like, so he didn't walk in front of a camera. Like, how the hell is this possible? Yeah. You know. So then I, so I started hunting him. I was like, wow, he's moving in the daylight. And I started hunting him, and I saw him again out of a stand. And then, I don't know, a couple of days later, you know, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a month long quest you know because that's the normal where i live and so i had this 
uh, it's kind of a long story. I had this little sliver of property that I had a stand in because I thought it belonged to someone else. And then it turns out I ran into a guy and he goes, no, this is someone else's property. You're not supposed to be hunting here. Oh, I'm like, oh, shoot, you know. So I threw my stand out and my steps had grown into the tree. So I just left Oops. them. Yeah. So Sorry. Yeah. I do a lot of um, load development and, and um, rifle testing for other magazines. So I was out, I'm always out shooting this, you know, pull out up in the National Forest. And this guy stops and he's chatting with me. We talk about an hour and I'm like, all right, my gun's cooled down. I got to get back at it. And he kept stopping all winter long. He's stopping and talking to me. We finally introduce each other and it's the guy who owns this property. Oh, okay. So I'm like, how cool is this? Cause now we've developed this rapport. So I'm like, oh, hey, I'm your neighbor. You know, um, I called you one time and left a message and you know, can I, can I bow hunt over there? I'm only gonna bow hunt. And he's like, eh, I don't know. He wouldn't give me an answer. Eh, I don't know, I don't know. This went on for months. Oh, wow. So during the spring when we're, you know, we do a lot of varmint shooting, I kept dropping in. He has a logging operation where they their work on equipment. I kept dropping in and visiting. Finally, at the end of the summer, it's like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I got busy, never got around to getting a stand up there. So I took a saddle, which I had never hunted out of. And so the steps were already in place. So I climbed up there one morning in the saddle. And you had never hunted out of a saddle before? No, never. Okay. I actually, I was going to go get in in the dark. So I hooked it up to a, um, an engine puller winch in my shop and messed with it and kind of figured out how it worked. And I'm like, okay, this is easy enough. And you're, you got some, all right. Cool. So I climb up there in the dark and I get, I get set up and. So, I don't know, 8, 8, 30. Well, I get up there and it's misting. And the reason that I'd like, okay, I got to get in the stand this morning because the weather had changed considerably. Um, it had been really warm and, and clear. And then this front came in. I said, they're going to move tomorrow. So, I get up there, I don't know, it's 8, 30 or 9. And it turns from mist slowly, 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 raining a little harder, a little harder. So, it kind of sneaks up on you where it's like, damn, it's raining man it's kind of miserable and you know of course bow hunting in the rain is always makes you nervous mm -hmm. you know so i'm already kind of thinking like i need to get out of here and i look over see a deer glass and it's my buck and he is there's these two big crp fields with these rose rose bushes the wild rose that they love those those sweet rose mm -hmm. hips but he's cutting down he's going into this creek bed I said, wow, there's an opportunity to maybe stalk this buck. So I don't even know why. I didn't unhook the saddle and climb down with it. I climbed out of the saddle while I was still up in the tree <laughs> for some reason. Don't do this at home. Yeah. And I left it up there, and I climbed down. And um, so I hit the ground, ran, made a big circle, and I'm still hunting up this creek bed. And I thought, what are you doing? Sit down. You're not going to still hunt them. So I sat down, and... Had a couple shooting lanes. And so you're just sitting, what, on a ditch? or I was sitting against a stump or something. You My know. gosh. Man, it's raining, you know, so. This is all making sense because I'm, I'm, I'm remembering the pictures, but keep going. So I'm sitting there, and I'm getting wetter and wetter. I mean, it's soaked through by now. I don't have rain gear on because I'm bow hunting. And it's, you know, it, it goes on and on long enough to where I've convinced myself, all right, this isn't going to happen. And I literally, like, I get up on my knees. I'm about to get up. And I'm like, oh, shoot, there he is. Oh, my gosh. So I plop that back down. And I'm sitting there, and he's angling the wrong. I'm like, How far away? Oh, you know, maybe like 50 yards right now. I'm thinking, eh, this isn't going to happen. He's not going the right way. And then he kind of veers, and he comes over to my shooting lane. And he comes into the shooting lane, quartering to, to me. I can't shoot. Mills around for a while, won't give me a shot. I mean, I'm drawing my bow and letting down. And, and then he turns and just walks out of the shooting lane, back into the brush. I'm like, oh, he is gone. He's slipped between my fingers. So I'm thinking, all right, maybe I can crawl down into the creek bed and take off down the creek bed and come around again. And I'm thinking about this. I get up on my knees, and I look, and he's come back into my shooting lane. And he's broadside. I'm like, holy cow. Oh, Oh, and I, I forgot to say, when I got out of the tree stand, I have my bow and one arrow. I've left my binos. I've left everything. Your is, quiver? 
Uh, you have one arrow? I have a cat quiver. Yeah, I have one arrow in my bow that I let down off of the... So you the, didn't have your quiver with you? No, I didn't have nothing. I have one arrow and a bow. Wow. I don't have binoculars. I don't have anything. Range finder? No, no, no range finder. No range finders are in the binoculars. So, anyways, he comes back. He's broadside. It is raining. This is fascinating to me. Our deer jump the string pretty much 90% of the time. You can count on it. So, I mean, you aim, you aim for a heart shot and you usually make a lung mm-hmm. shot. Or they spin a lot. Mm-hmm. So, he walks out broadside 30 yards and... I, you know, don't get busted drawing my bow. And I just aimed middle, you know, like normal, thinking there's no way he's going to jump the string in the in the ring. Release, you know, you don't know, see what happens. It happens so fast. But all I know, he's 100% broadside, and when he's running off, it's the arrow is quartering in severely from, like, the last rib in. But I'm looking like, oh, it looks, that looks good, looks good. You know, now I'm thrilled. I tend to, I bow hunted long enough, I tend to keep it together before. Afterwards, I, mm-hmm. that's when the adrenaline really gets going. So I, you know, real pumped and I sit, you know, sit in the rain for about 15 minutes and I said, ah, he's dead. So he ran down this creek bed, kind of straight down. I think, hey, he's going to be piled up in the bottom. And I, um, so I just bebop down there. It's raining, there's no blood. Get to the bottom, no deer. Like, how's this possible? So I thought, all right, he'll go downhill. So I go down the creek bed, 100 yards, no deer. Like, uh oh, you got a problem. Maybe it wasn't as good as, you know, those quartering shots. You never know. Sometimes they just look better than they are. So I circle around, I go back to the house. The house is about a mile away, maybe. Eat breakfast, grab the dog, go back, and. Oh, that's funny. When I walked back out, I looked across the creek bed, and I saw something that looked out of place, but I didn't have binos. Oh I'm gosh. looking like, what is that? And I'm like, eh, it's nothing. <clears throat> so when I came back with the dog, I went back by the stand, and, and I grabbed my quiver and my binos and everything. And I get back to that same point, and I'm looking at, and there's that thing I was looking at. And I looked at the binoculars, like, oh, there he is. Oh, my gosh. So the dog, it's over there messing around with some quail. He didn't even get in on this. And that deer went straight downhill 100 yards and then ran uphill 50 yards. And, and I didn't think too much of it. I thought, well, liver shot or something. When I field dressed him, the broadhead hole right through the middle of his heart. He ran 150 yards, heart shot. Heart shot. I, I, uphill the we, last we, 50 You know, yards. and it's funny you mentioned that we just dropped a video last week. How long can a deer live when it's heart shot? And uh, now I can't remember the exact amount of time. Well, and we're talking like the top of the heart, right. too. Right, center punch. Severed arteries. Right. And but there's enough oxygen in the brain to allow them to, you know, live for X amount of seconds. And they can run 30 miles an hour. Um, so you figure, well, okay, well, he went 150 yards. Well, you can go pretty, get there pretty fast if he's running 30 miles an hour. I mean, Yeah, he, well, you know, too, mm-hmm. that buck's five and a half years old, mountain buck, survived tougher than nails god knows what you know winters and mountain lions and they're just tough. what a story they're just tough deer talk now is brought to you by the all-new phase four this bowl gives hunters comfort accuracy and the ability to customize their ideal setup for different kinds of hunting for more information visit your local matthews dealer or go to matthewsinc.com now, um, everybody's going to ask anyways, and this isn't a, a gratuitous mention. What, what was your gear? What bow? What broadhead? Oh, yeah. No, I had a really... I, I was shooting a Prime Revex, and I've shot some Primes in the past, and I've always liked them, but, man, I tell you what, that bow, it kind of shoots itself. Mm-hmm. I'm getting ready to go Barbary sheep hunting here. It's a lightweight bow, about a 32-inch, maybe? 30... 33, 34. Okay. It's a longer bow, which I like because I'm a tall guy. But, are you, uh, are you left-handed? I am now. I, I injured my left hand yeah. about two years ago. So you actually taught yourself to shoot left-handed. Yeah, and I mean, with certain handicaps too. I'm missing my my index finger now, and my thumb's kind of worthless. The My trigger fingers was my middle finger is totally numb and doesn't have 
full range of motion. Right. So I had to fight pretty hard for about nine months to shoot I remember. again at all. Yeah. And I actually shooting good now because I've gotten I'm rid glad, of so I'm many glad, bad I'm habits. I'm glad you are shooting again. What about the, was it expandable broadhead or fixed Oh, point? so I was shooting that um, hmm. Wacom Hybrid. Okay. So not only was... I haven't shot those. So not only was it a heart shot, but it was, mm. you know, like an inch and three sixteenths by two inches or something. So just an incredibly aggressive broadhead. Um, I was shooting the prime arrows because I was shooting the prime bow. I figured that was a good match. Um, now, in hindsight, a- after you found them, okay, you see them coming back. Um, huge relief. You see the buckle in there. What, would there have been any blood trail for you? No, it was raining. Yeah. I mean, that's that's why I don't like bow hunting right, in the rain. So. And, I mean, I live in the northwest. I mean, northern Idaho is part of the northwest, the inland northwest, mm-hmm. and it's it's wet. I mean, our November's, we get, I don't remember the figures, 30% of our, our precipitation in November. It's, it's always raining. So you're always hunting. And that was going to be my comment because it's like every time I see a, a hero shot with Pat, it looks like you're your drone rat. I mean, it's uh, like yeah, and the the, the deer the deer's all. wet, and I can tell that the Northwest has a look. I don't know why it is, but it's it's a look. It's that it, it's the it's the dark boreal forest kind of foggy, foggy and, like yeah. it's almost like a mood. And uh, your deer have a look to them too. But I remember when you posted that photo, I'm like, oh dang, he did it again. I was happy because. So, you know, I knew I knew about what you went through with your hand. This was about what almost two years ago now. Yeah, um, about we're a couple weeks short of two years. A lot of uh, physical therapy and trying to figure out if you're going to be able to shoot a bow again, and you can shoot a bow again, and um, and now you're doing it. Which well, I think is so awesome. many people are like, "Oh, I'm amazed at what you did," and I'm like, "I didn't have a choice, man." I'm gonna that, that's <laughs> his that's his attitude, though. He's just like, "Ah, eh, whatever." I'm like, "I'm going to shoot a bow." It's inspirational. One way or the other. I am going to shoot a bow. It's inspirational. You know? If I'd had to use my teeth, I would have figured out something. You would have figured out how to know? shoot them. Because, I, I mean, it's my life, and it's, I can't imagine not shooting a bow, not bow hunting. I mean, I, the first year after the injury, I, I crossbow hunted. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. I am not anti-crossbow. I know. I just, We've had this they discussion. They are just not for me. Because I started bow hunting with recurves. Mm-hmm. I, I trad... I shot trad bows forever, not because some, you know, holier-than-thou attitude. It was just that the, when I was a kid and started bow hunting in the 70s, there was no advantage to shooting one of those clattery compounds. But we all shot recurves. And so, I don't know, it's even compounds to a point are going backwards a oh, little they bit are. for me. Yeah, they yeah. are. A lot of them are. I mean, it, and it's just like, but like you said, it's, you're the same way. I've, I've been talking to so many people uh, this year. Um, they or they've dabbled, they've tried crossbow, didn't like it's not for them. Me, you know me, I'm 50-50, I could go either way. Yeah. I, I mean, well, I can use a, I can use a crossbow, I can use my, my Matthews. I, it, it really doesn't matter to me. I, li- I just I, love hunting. Again, I don't have any problem with them, especially in the east. They can't kill enough deer in the east right. to keep up with management objectives. So I don't have a problem with I do have a problem with it in the west because our tags are so limited right. in most areas that and let's face it, those are not bow hunters that are choosing a crossbow. Those are rifle hunters taking mm-hmm. advantage of better seasons. Different, it's a different demographic. So, like, I moved away from New Mexico because I didn't draw an elk tag for 15 years. Like, you throw crossbow hunters on, into those odds. Well, no, it makes it even more difficult. Forget about okay, it. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting the wave here. So we're going we're gonna to wrap that up. Pat, that was an awesome story. What we're going to do for all of you, if you are um, listening to this, you're kind of out of luck. You're going to have to go over and watch it. But we're going to put some pictures of Pat's deer in the video version of this podcast. So you can see those um, video versions on YouTube. It's uh, YouTube backslash DDH online or the Facebook version or the Instagram version. But we want to thank everybody for um, all the success that we've had. I think last year, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Mac, we had 150,000 downloads just on the podcast, which is awesome. That's testament to everybody who's been asking us just let's have some stories like this and i have enough friends like pat that can share these stories we very much appreciate it but uh pat thank you very much yeah, and uh if, if they want to check out your stuff it's inside archery uh your website inside archery.com and inside firearms.com and they, they are the uh, uh a source for so much uh great information on everything within both industries for pat 
May Team. I am Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now. We're going to bring you a new episode again next Thursday, every Thursday, here on Deer Talk Now. <laughs>